It's very nice to be here, first of all, and to have the opportunity to practice together and also to do a little tiny bit of service to my good friend, Venerable Adimoti, who is also quite an inspiration, I think, to, to me and I'm sure to all of you in that she's developing a community and this is really not an easy thing to do. It involves a lot of loving kindness, it involves a lot of metta and a lot of self-sacrifice as well, you know, a real sense of understanding that one's own well-being is intimately connected to the well-being of others and the well-being of community, you know, we grow in community, we learn from each other, we can emulate each other's good qualities, we can get inspiration from each other, we can discuss the Dhamma together, so hopefully we can do a bit of that today. So I would like to speak and practice on the theme of loving kindness, um, partly because Venerable Adi said that you haven't done that for a while, but also because it's one of the practices that I regularly do and I find great benefit in. I also feel that it's heart, the heart really, literally also of the path. Um, it's almost like a thread that connects all the different factors of the Opal Path and I'll explain that a little bit more at the end of the meditation session. And also want to give you a chance and an opportunity to talk about loving kindness in the light of your own practice, perhaps in uh, relation to your lives, maybe any struggles that you have in your lives or maybe some inspirations that you have as well. It's not only about struggles and, uh, and we can learn from each other. For me, it's always so enriching to hear other people's perspectives. Um, I was saying to Venerable Adi before we began that it can be boring to be inside my own head with my own limited range of experiences and stories and you know examples, but it's really beautiful to have that um, input from others. So we will have time for some Q&A. So shall we begin with a little meditation session? And... Um, just bearing in mind that whatever I suggest, whatever comes forth that I don't always plan is just that, it's an invitation, it's a suggestion. Um, and if it doesn't work for you, just leave it aside. Yeah, There's not a right or a, a wrong way to do this. And it's important to understand that we're not looking for results. Yeah, We're learning to put the causes in place for the practice to deepen and grow on its own. Yeah, so all we're doing really is planting seeds, just planting seeds and watering them with tender care. Yeah. So please get yourselves comfortable as best you possibly can. And you might wish to choose a traditional meditation posture. The traditional Asian posture is cross-legged, but I think we're developing our own traditions now in, in the West <laughs> among people who are not familiar with those postures. They don't grow up sitting cross-legged on the floor, and so perhaps our traditional posture is actually sitting on a chair or on a sofa. Nothing wrong with that at all. Some of you have your videos off, which is absolutely fine, and uh, that also gives you the chance to sit in any other kind of position. You might even be feeling tired and weary and even want to lie down. That's absolutely fine. And uh, do forgive me please if uh, my voice trails off at any point. That's just the nature of technology unfortunately. But just continue the practice. I think you know Trust your heart's wisdom that it knows the path. And just enjoying a moment of peace. A moment to connect, to reconnect with yourself. Recognizing that all your usual daily activities have been set aside for at least an hour or so.
And the only thing to do now is to care. To care for this moment. However it manifests to you. It can be helpful to settle the mind or to help with the transition from busyness to calm. To just take a few intentionally deeper breaths. Really experiencing the fullness of the in-breath and the release of a slightly longer out-breath. Relaxing the body more deeply as the breath moves out. Just contented to be here and to breathe. Allowing the breath to return to a natural rhythm. And I'd like us to start, if you wish, with a gentle body scan. Perhaps putting your attention, your awareness at the top of the head. And experiencing any sensations that are happening there. And adding kindness to the way that you're aware. As though mindfulness were like the light of the sun. Illuminating whatever is happening, wherever that sun shines. And kindness were like the warmth of the sun. Embracing soothing and gently relaxing whatever it shines upon. And this kind awareness, the warmth and the light of the sun keep on spreading across the forehead, into any areas of tension perhaps across the brow. Maybe tightness in the eyes.
soothing all the muscles of the face. Releasing any holding in the jaw. Moving down the neck. shoulders. Becoming aware of the sensations and also developing this friendly attitude of kindness towards them, simply allowing them to be, spreading down naturally through the arms, the elbows, to the hands, the fingers, the fingertips. You might find barely any efforts needed at all as though you were simply basking in the rays of the sun. Spreading this beautiful golden sunlight through the whole torso chest, the lungs, perhaps through the organs inside. Noticing any areas that need a little more attention. That need your kindness and care. And this kind awareness, this golden light of the sun spreads from the top of the back all the way through the spine, across the back, down to the hips. Simply receiving any experience that you have in the area of the back, the hips, and caring for that experience. Whether it's painful or pleasant, whether the experience is clear or dull. This kind awareness embraces everything equally. 
allowing the whole experience to relax. Spreading down to the buttocks, the thighs, the knees, leaving no part of the legs on top. Perhaps once again, staying a little longer in any areas that feel sore, achy, tight. Perhaps places where there's been an injury. And just trusting this beautiful, healing, kind awareness to do its work. Experiencing any sensations in the shins, the calves, the ankles. All the way through the feet to the very tips of the toes. As though your whole body were now soaked through with this gentle warmth and light of the sun. Noticing if there's any places in the body where your mind is still tightening up, the muscles are knotted, and just gently invite those muscles or that resistance to let go. Noticing the delight of a relaxed body and allowing that relaxation to go deeper still.
If you wish, you're welcome to just stay with this delight of a relaxed body. Enjoying the calm in the mind. Or if you wish, we could do a little bit of formal meta practice. By tuning in, first of all, to any pleasant sensation in the body or perhaps in the area around the heart. Gently resting your awareness with ease and lightness in your own heart center. And wishing yourself well. You may choose to use phrases if this helps to incline the mind towards loving kindness. Phrases that really capture your most heartfelt intention for yourself. I like to use the phrases, may I be happy, may I be free, may I be healed. May I be at peace. Simple phrases that capture a wish for your own well-being, safety, happiness and health. And see that you recite these phrases inwardly with a sense of their meaning. And listen to the space between each phrase. as though the phrases were like a seed that you were planting in fertile soil. And the kind awareness in that space between each phrase is like the sunshine and the rain. Enabling those seeds to sprout, to grow and to bear beautiful flowers according to nature in their own time. Trusting in the power of these intentions to bring about a felt sense of loving kindness in the heart without any expectation or demand. Just delighting in cultivating wholesome states again and again, again and again.
And if at any time you find the mind becoming tight or brittle, or any afflictive emotion arises, just come back to this kindful awareness that allows and embraces every experience in the warmth and the light of loving awareness. And if it feels good for you, again, refreshing the meaning of the phrases and planting them with tender care. Calmly, clearly, again and again with all the time in the world. So we're coming close to the end of this meditation. Before you open your eyes, just once again, expand your awareness to include the whole body from head to toe. Receiving whatever sensations you experience right now. And once again, just basking in the warmth and light of this kindful awareness. As though this were the only moment in the world for you. Pouring all your care all your loving kindness into this experience right now. So if you wish, when you're ready, you can take three slightly deeper breaths. Enjoying each breath 
as it comes in and as it goes out. And at the end of the third breath, if you wish, you can gently open your eyes and see if you can maintain that kind connection to your own body. even as we engage in some Dhamma discussion. So I can only see one of you with your eyes open and the rest are all in a a darkened room <laughs> so you may have disappeared or you may still be there I don't know <laughs> so I hope that you're feeling even a little bit more relaxed than when you arrived simply through having made connection made contact with your inner world And uh, in that meditation, I tried to bring a couple of aspects of loving kindness into play. So the first one really related to the way we can use metta or kindful awareness, if you like, as a way of looking at experience, as a perception or a disposition to the world. So one of the places in the Eightfold Path that metta is first mentioned is in the second factor, which is called right intention. And I'm not sure how well versed many of you are, probably quite well versed in Buddhist theory. Um, I think many of you are from a Sri Lankan background and others are probably strong supporters of the Bhikkhuni Sangha in New Zealand and perhaps beyond. And so you may be quite familiar with uh, the three right intentions that are sometimes translated as right thought. And I think these are very uh, much connected to loving kindness. The first of those right intentions is called Nekama Sankapa. And it really means the intention to, um, to let go of sensuality, of, of greed, of sense desire. So it's a kind of relinquishment of our own um, sensory attachments, if you like, and a simplification of the mind. So this protects loving kindness from becoming um, too clingy and attached. One of the near enemies of loving kindness is said to be attachment or, or affection to another person you know Ajahn Chah used to say if you have too much loving kindness the danger is that you might make babies <laughs> I don't know how true that is but this is when loving kindness is actually not pure the real meaning of loving kindness is the kind of love that is a spiritual love that simply wishes all beings well and it's a very exalted type of love it's not a an attached love or a love that has any expectations in return. It's the kind of love that just gives without, for the sake of giving, you could say, it gives for the love of giving, just because it's such a beautiful thing to do. And we can see loving kindness as a kind of benevolence, a kind of well-wishing that all beings be safe, be protected, be well, all beings thrive, whoever they are, and it's impartial. It doesn't spread loving kindness only. Loving kindness doesn't only extend to people that we like or even experiences or perceptions that we like. You know, we can have loving kindness towards our enemies as well. And by extension, sometimes we make enemies of our mind. You know, sometimes we find it easy to have loving kindness, even forgiveness towards other people. But when it comes to ourselves, when it comes to our own mind or our own um, difficult experiences inside, whether pains in the body or irritable moods, we have trouble accepting and embracing that aspect of what we take to be a self. So loving kindness has this uh, sense of impartiality and um, 
and benevolence towards everything that arises in our field of perception, every being in this world. And uh, I like to think of it as a kind of expansive state. Um, many of you might know my teacher, Ajahn Brahm. He was one of the first uh, Western uh, senior monks who um, allowed women to take the bhikkhuni ordination, or let's say facilitated and supported the bhikkhuni ordination, so that women could also live the spiritual life to its full, to its fullest extent. In the way that the Buddha uh, described and the Buddha um, laid down as one of the most effective vehicles for full liberation. And uh, when he made that move, and <laughs> it was actually received fairly negatively amongst many of uh, his peers, and they decided to uh, delist him from the uh, associated monasteries which he was a part of at that time. And uh, he put this very beautiful poem up, or somebody put this very beautiful poem up on their website at the time, and it said, uh, um, how did it go? Uh, ooh, now I forget how it went. They drew a circle to keep me out. Rebel, heretic, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took them in. And I think this is a really beautiful expression of loving kindness. It's by somebody called Edward Markham or Edwin Markham. I don't know who that is. But um, this idea of ever expanding circles of what we're able to accept, what we're able to include, the people we're able to include in our lives, the situations we're able to include, you know, the physical experiences, physical sensations that we're able to embrace and even welcome into our lives, you know. Many of us, especially as we're getting older, might have chronic health conditions or maybe chronic pain. Can we also include that into what, you know, we consider acceptable? Um, can we even welcome and even celebrate that as an opportunity to learn, to expand our loving kindness, to expand this circle of what is allowed in and what we keep outside? One of the other definitions of loving kindness is Sima Sambeda, and it means that which breaks boundaries. So it's breaking the boundaries between, say, the rich and the poor, or the black and the white, the privileged and the less privileged, you know, the gay people, members of the LGBTQIA communities, and the people from, you know, who are heterosexual, because we live in a very heteronormative society. You know, can we break or at least soften some of these boundaries so that we actually learn to listen to each other's experience and to understand how it feels to be marginalized? Yeah. So sometimes people think of loving kindness as something quite fluffy and, you know, to experience love, you have to have this feeling of warmth. And certainly this is a part of the experience of loving kindness, but it is really much more than that. And I think there can be a danger in. Um, thinking that meta means we have to always be in a good mood or we always have to be maybe popular or liked by others. Because meta also can be strong and firm. Meta can have um, not a boundary as to who we keep out, but it can have a protective kind of boundary towards ourself and a protection, a sense of protection towards others. So we don't allow others to abuse us and we also learn to try and understand life from other people's perspectives as well. Yeah, so that little by little our societies can become much more inclusive and equitable for all. So this is a kind of loving kindness that um, we can develop in communities and we can also develop um, loving kindness in the way that we serve, the way that we care for others. And in the suttas, there are many places where the Buddha praises his monks and I'm sure his nuns as well, but unfortunately some of the female history is less evident than the male history. That's just the way that bias comes out in the way that texts are preserved. But um, one of the examples he uses is three monks who lived together and dwelled with eyes of loving kindness, with kindly eyes like milk and water. And they used to do all kinds of little services for each other so that they started to dissolve this sort of selfishness that thinks about one's own needs and one's own good, but to think about the good of all. And he praised them for having very good meditation. Um, and later on, they actually became enlightened. So he praised them for their practice. 
So loving kindness is a kind of way that we relate to the world. It's also a cultivation. It's something we can do. Yeah. It's not that some people have a lot of loving kindness, whereas other people don't, but it's something that can be built. It can be um, developed and deepened and really made a kind of um, compass for the mind. So the Buddha said, you know, if it wasn't possible to develop wholesome states, he wouldn't ask us to do it. But because it is possible, it is possible to develop the wholesome and to actually overcome things like ill will and um, craving, even delusion, that he asks us to practice. And metta, as, again, is not just a filler on the path. It's something like the heart of the practice. You know, it's where we're coming from when we practice. But it's also a form of sense restraint. It's a form of right effort, allowing the wholesome states to increase and develop and come to fulfillment, and also keeping the unwholesome states out. The Buddha actually said that when we um, have thoughts of loving kindness, it's impossible to simultaneously have thoughts of ill will. So at the very least, if all you manage to do, so-called all you manage to do in your practice, is to think thoughts of loving kindness, even if you're not getting this gushing feeling of bliss, at that moment you are actually keeping at bay any thoughts of ill will, you're keeping them out, you're protecting the mind. And so it's a form of guarding and protecting the senses and also developing this inner virtue, you know, and gradually we condition the mind. So even if you get a little bit of time in the day, you know, it might be five minutes where you feel like you have nothing in particular to do, just sitting down and closing your eyes, connecting with your body as we did in the meditation in a kindly way, allowing it to relax, and then just having a couple of thoughts of goodwill, perhaps towards yourself or maybe towards a situation or a person who you feel irritated towards. This can be really, really powerful in the long run because it's just gently guiding the mind in a new direction away from unskillful states that basically bring a lot of suffering to you and harm to another person. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of walking into a room or walking up to a person and kind of feeling a little bit uncomfortable and ill at ease. And there's a sense, maybe, you know, it might be a couple of people and you have this sense that they've been maybe talking about you in a negative way or, you know, getting a piece of information and sort of interpreting it incorrectly. And sometimes we intuitively get that, don't we? We know that and we feel a little bit unsafe and ill at ease around such people or around that kind of atmosphere. And the Buddha also said it's important to have thoughts of loving kindness, not only when we're around a person, not only to speak kind words, but also to think kind thoughts in private when we're alone. And this is one really wonderful way of overcoming anger and ill will. So much of the time we dwell on all the things that are wrong, you know, in the world or in others. And, you know, we're not denying those things, but sometimes we have such a skewed perception, you know, if we always let our mind go in those ways. You know, especially in times where there are horrific things happening in this world. Um, both Venerable Adi Muti and myself have lived for many years in Myanmar and it's really tragic to see the situation unfold there now with the military, um, what can you call them? Mm, well, it's a military coup. They're really terrorists taking over that country and literally mindlessly beating people up and, you know, taking people's lives. And uh, the people in that country are that some of the most gentle that I've ever met, some of the most virtuous that I've ever met, um, who've done nothing to deserve this kind of treatment other than be, you know, unfortunately under this kind of regime. And it can be so depressing to the mind to dwell on these things. And sometimes I wonder, it's important to be informed, but when that kind of exposure to the horrors that are happening all around us and now the war in Ukraine, when that leads to things like, you know, despair or a feeling of helplessness, a feeling of perhaps depression or even empathetic distress, it's not really benefiting you anymore to keep on, you know, in a sense, rolling, you know, or robbing your mind in this information 
you know, when there's nothing really you can do. Sometimes the skillful thing is to take yourself a few steps out, to meet those feelings with an attitude of kindness and care, you know, and compassion for the pain that you might be feeling and the suffering of others as well. And then to turn the mind towards thoughts of loving kindness, to resource ourselves. You know, it's not a selfish thing to do. We need to be resourced if we're going to have anything else to offer to the world. And when the mind does have um, a degree of balance, it's much easier to see where we can take appropriate action. What is the appropriate action to take? You know, sometimes we don't feel that we can do much, but we can always be um, kind to our neighbor. You know, maybe we can get online and have a look at some charities that are sending aid out to people who are maybe refugees. Um, maybe we can actually think about downsizing or even, you know, offering a room in our home to somebody who's homeless or somebody who's a refugee. There are so many different ways we can help, you know, developing communities, spiritual sanctuaries where people can come and get resourced. These are all uh, manifestations of loving kindness, active loving kindness in this world. And loving kindness is not only an antidote to uh, the coarser forms of ill will and anger and despair, but um, it was interesting today I was speaking to a friend who's a very close Dhamma friend who I'm staying with here in Perth. She actually used to be a nun as well with me at Dhammasara Monastery in Perth. And I asked her what metta meant to her. And the first thing she um, talked about was the fact that it can be developed, you know, that it can grow. And she was pointing towards, um, you know, the, the time it can really take and the idea of not giving up, but trusting in the process, trusting in the cultivation in itself. And she also reminded me that Ajahn Brahm sometimes talks about how difficult it is for some people to develop metta, how difficult it can be even to um, find someone or something in your life that you have a natural sense of warmth and loving kindness toward. And somebody once came to Ajahn Brahm in this situation. Um, he'd sort of asked this person whether they had uh, someone in their life, like a close friend, and they said, well, no, there's nobody that I feel you know, that feeling of warmth towards in particular, like they find it quite difficult to connect to that. Um, and also they didn't have a pet or um, anything else that could have been easier, but they did have a little plant in their house. And, uh, and they found that they could develop loving kindness towards this plant. And my friend today was saying that uh, it took her a while, but she connected to that story eventually by realizing that much of the time in her life, she was actually going around with a kind of uh, a sense of grumbling at life and even a sense of being kind of bored. And she slowly started to recognize that as a type of ill will, a type of aversion. And at the same time, she realized she was never bored when she was in nature, when she was around plants and trees and you know birds and this person's actually um, a keen environmentalist and a climate activist and um, you know has done a lot of work in the bush when we were at the monastery together in Dhammasara we used, she used to be the environmental um, officer which is a voluntary role and I was her kind of assistant so we used to go into the bush and collect seeds and try to propagate these seeds and then do a lot of re -veg vegetation in the monastery and she um, suddenly realized that she never felt um, bored in nature. She always had this sense of connection and a sense of um, nurturing and really caring for everything that was around her. And that brought to mind that loving kindness is like, it's almost like a lens that we see the world through. It's a kind of disposition that we bring to life. And so in the same way she realized that she could have learn to cultivate the same disposition towards the people in her life and even the different moods that would pass through her mind. Um, you know, all the different experiences, experiences, for example, like rejection. How many of us have felt rejected by people that we care very, very much about? You know, just um, last rains, I received a very unexpected letter from a very old friend who's been a Dhamma sister on my path since I think 1998 and um, she'd come to visit me about two years ago uh, when I was living in Oxford as a nun 
and she's not a nun, she's a lay person, and I could see she felt a little bit awkward, and there was a little bit of a, perhaps a very slight misunderstanding about how things would be at the monastery. So I wrote her a letter and said, you know, next time we could talk about it and arrange things a bit differently so I can spend more time with you. But then I got a letter back from her that I didn't expect, and it basically said, um, I'm sorry to say this, I don't want to hurt you, but I don't feel... Um, very close to you anymore it's been like this for many years I think we've grown apart you know you've changed and I've changed and I just can't be I can't really share very deeply with you anymore and I read this letter and I was kind of whew, taken aback because for me it's very natural that people grow apart and that the relationships change but I hadn't ever really had an experience in my life where I felt I needed to actually draw a line under a, a relationship for that reason. But this was very clearly what um, my friend was saying. And for a few days, I was really quite dejected, feeling quite hurt and, you know, kind of sense of, is there something wrong with me? Have I done something wrong? Um, often it's very typical, especially for women, I think, to blame themselves. <laughs> And uh, luckily there was a, a retreat happening at the time. It was um, a, lot, a meta retreat with lots of different monks and nuns who'd uh, recorded guided meta meditations. And I took part in that and practiced a lot of loving kindness, just nurturing this little, I, I could identify that it was related to um, childhood in a way, like this little rejected child inside that needed love and that needed care. And I managed to somehow embrace that part of myself and give myself that love, that acceptance, that um, that sense of yeah, that sense of acceptance and security through my own practice of loving kindness. And I also made a decision at that time not to shut this person out, you know, because I could experience firsthand how painful that had been for me, and I knew that I wanted my heart to remain open and, and wide. And everybody makes their own decisions. It's not that I would judge her for that. But it was ironic that since the email and since this decision to open my heart and embrace my own feelings of rejection, which for me are some of the most terrifying feelings I can have, much more so than physical pain, um, from there a real shift happened. And I actually felt much more connected to this person than before because perhaps there was this intentional... Um, this intentional effort, you could say, or decision or choice to open rather than close the heart, you know. And I started to notice things even in my residence at that time that reminded me of her, like there were these curtains with a sort of Indian print with little elephants and peacocks and we'd spent a long time in India together and it, was, it reminded me of her and it made me very happy um, to feel that, you know, we could still be close, even if somebody doesn't want to speak to you, even if you know, things aren't going the way you wish. If we have that sense of love and kindness towards ourselves, we can face those ups and downs with a sense of resilience and maintaining an open heart. So these are just a few little examples about loving kindness, the way we can develop it as a practice. And that practice can lead all the way into deep states of samadhi, deep states of calm. You know, one of the main ways that loving kindness works for that is by overcoming the hindrance of ill will, which is such a pervasive hindrance in the mind. You know, it can manifest, as I said, even as boredom or even maybe a little bit of drowsiness. The mind's just turning off because it's not really engaged, it's not really caring for the moment. Yeah, and, and of course, the coarser forms of ill will that leave us with a lot of um, resentment and these hard and hardened kind of contracted states of mind so loving kindness helps to soften those and and soften the other hindrances as well so that it paves the way into these peaceful deep states of basically heightened awareness um, that are infused with happiness and joy and the other um, beautiful aspect of loving kindness is that uh, it is a very happy state of mind you know the same friend that i was speaking to today was um talking about one of the experiences she draws on again and again, which is of um, 
one of the first times that she was breastfeeding her little one, her first child, and then he suddenly looked up and opened his eyes and gave her this enormous smile. And she got such a flood of endorphins. It's oxytocin, I think, isn't it? This hormone, you know, that brings so much happiness and connection um, that she can draw on that experience again and again whenever she wants to um, connect to the felt meaning of loving kindness. And that can be a kind of springboard from which to extend that sense of loving kindness out. So loving kindness is very much related to these happy hormones, if you like, um, and happiness is an important part of the path. It's actually the proximate cause for deep states of samadhi, the jhana states, the jhanas, four jhanas that the Buddha taught. And uh, we don't practice these things only for the sake of bliss. But the Buddha also said that after practicing, you know, deep states of samadhi, if, if this ever happens to you, you know, through your practice, or even sometimes it can happen most unexpectedly, almost by chance, we also can develop wisdom into the conditioned nature of those states themselves. So loving kindness can take us all the way, you know, from developing a very deep inner virtue, learning sense restraint, how to develop the wholesome states, how to have a wise motivation to everything we experience, but also to these deep states of, uh, of calm, samadhi states, and beyond. So the Buddha said one of the things we can do if we have you know, developed uh, deep samadhi is reflect on the conditioned nature of those states, understanding that they too are impermanent and will pass away. Yeah? And also that that's not the final goal. You know, there is something higher. There is a state beyond all suffering, beyond all happiness and pain. So my encouragement really today is just to um, think a little bit about how loving kindness could perhaps um, deepen your practice or help you in certain situations in your life. You know, how loving kindness can be um, a part of practicing virtue, a part of undermining um, unwholesome states of mind. And just to, you know, remind us that we always have some time in the day, we always have some time to just incline the mind skillfully, um, to bring up wise thought, you know, to bring up uh, well-wishing for other beings or for ourselves. So every moment counts, you know, the mind is conditioned and therefore it can be moulded in a wholesome way. It can be moulded in ways that are going to be of benefit to ourselves, an enormous benefit to those around us and in the greater world too. We might not be able to solve every problem, of course, we cannot, right? Remember when the Buddha was actually approached in the beginning after his enlightenment, or was it um, even before his enlightenment, I think? Um, I'm getting a little bit tired, but... Um, he was basically uh, kind of tempted by Mara, you know, to become the great kind of monarch of the world, like somebody with all the superpowers to obliterate, you know, material suffering and other things and to become all powerful in the world. Um, and he rejected that because he knew that the best and most powerful thing he could possibly do was to purify his mind. So nobody, not even the most powerful emperor or empress, can actually eradicate suffering from this world. And, you know, it's quite overwhelming to imagine that we, yeah, to even try, right? Or to think about how that could be possible. This is samsara. And as my teacher says, samsara sucks. <laughs> but there is always something we can do to bring that little more happiness to our world, to ourselves. And sometimes it's just giving someone a smile. You know, even when you're in a bad mood, even when somebody's cut you off in traffic or, I don't know, when you've had bad news at the doctors, still we can try and smile and remember that other people experience just the same suffering in their lives too. So I hope there's something in benefit there. I didn't really prepare this um, teaching today, so it came out in the way it came. <laughs> Maybe a little bit here, a little bit there, but hopefully... Um, there's something we can maybe discuss now together if you wish and I would really love to hear from anybody that would like to share. Um, I know that in these sessions you do have um, the ability to unmute yourself and simply speak 
but it might be helpful, like uh, Janaki just did, to still raise your hand. There's a little, um, on my screen anyway, there's a reactions button, but I think there are some other buttons too, like a participants. There's another button somewhere with a raise hand sign. So if you wish, you could do that and um, I'll come to you one by one. So, Janaki, would you like to unmute? Yes, thank you. Um, I know that loving kindness for Metta, it, it, has, it has become a very controversial term or issue because lots of people are arguing that it, it doesn't give the real meaning of that. Um, so I would rather prefer to accept the translation given by Punaji Mahathero. Um, he suggested um, universal benevolence. So that means so you are not, I mean, every, every being is included, see, no, unseen, no, no, unknown. Um, <laughs> almost everybody. Um, so, and it, it is a kind of a benevolence and you can achieve that only if you let by letting go and by getting rid of your, your self-image, then of course you can treat everybody alike. And whether somebody has done something to you, uh, something bad or good, but still then you won't have any attachment to that person. Um, and But then again, I find it a little bit difficult uh, in, in one case, you know, in Karaniya Metta Sutra, Buddha himself has said, that you, when you um, think of others or of all all beings, all beings, just like the mother, a mother thinks of her own child. That it says in Kanya Metta Sutra, Mata Yatani Amputan Ayusa Ekamun Putta Manurakhi. So uh, protect the uh, or take care of everyone, just like a mother who has. Uh, her only child, that kind of attention. So that means, yes, that you have to give the attention, but how do you understand this one? Um, for a woman, it's easier, I think. And a mother, it's easier. But then a man cannot, <laughs> I mean, unless you become an Arahant or a Buddha. Right, but everybody so, can. <laughs> everybody can <laughs> get enlightened. Okay, now, I know there, there, there is a, you know, a kind of controversy going on because of, you know, these monks and nuns and some people, they don't want to accept the bikinis and they don't, mm. uh, such nonsense. But Buddha, it was the Buddha who gave that uh, explanation or that example. Yes, yes. That, that how well, and the Buddha should... ordained um, monks and nuns, that was part of his no, agenda no, no, the whole time. No, I mean... Not that, because he understood very well, clearly and yeah. properly, because that's why he is Buddha. So he gave that example. Mm -hmm. If you want to, uh, I mean, share metta with anybody, it's just like a mother uh, who cares for her only child. So it's a great, okay. I mean, yeah. it is. So is there a question, like, could you just ask the specific question? Because I'm getting a bit yeah, lost Yeah, now. the thing is, that, yeah, the specific question is, Yes, so rather than using the, uh, the term loving kindness, if you use the word, I mean, that term universal balance, I think it explains much better. Um, metta is explained much better in that way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's interesting. And I think, you know, part of the... Uh, the good thing about having different translations is that it gets us to think and it gets us to um, take different angles on these things like the term loving kindness. The fact that somebody translated it as loving kindness is now food for thought so that we can refine it even further. And the whole point of this is not really to get the correct translation, but to see what different avenues it might open up for our practice, I think. Um, I like the word benevolence because it's a kind of um, well-wishing for all beings, but I would personally take out the word universal simply because I don't feel it's only for beings. You know, I think it's a benevolence in attitude as well. And I think, um, you know, for me, it's helpful to think of um, 
loving kindness as a kind of uh, disposition towards everything in life. So not only towards all kinds of different beings, but even towards different moods, different uh, emotions, even towards things like meditation objects, even we can benevolent, be benevolent towards our breath. Right? It's possible to have a perception of loving kindness towards our breath, an attitude of care. So, I mean, that's just my take on it, on what you said, but absolutely. I mean, there's no right or wrong absolute definition of metta. I mean, the word metta in, comes from the Sanskrit metri and mitta in Pali, which means friend. So it's like a sense of friendliness, or you could say befriending. You could say befriending all beings, befriending your body, befriending your mind. So, you know, there are so many different nuances to it, and I think it's wonderful to keep on expanding. Um, the bit about the mother loving the only child, I think it's a wonderful example. But the difference there is uh, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. So he's not actually saying it's the same as a mother's love for her child. He's saying it's that love made unconditional, made impartial, you know, because the mother's love for the child is very much... I would think it's very powerful loving kindness, but there is attachment there. Unless you're almost enlightened, there's bound to be attachment there, right? So it's not actually the same as a mother's love. It's more like it's of the nature of a mother's love in the same way that you would want to protect life. The way that you'd want to protect the life of your child, you want to protect the life of all beings, anuraka, right? So it's about the protective aspect. Um, you know, like if you see somebody in the street being hurt or harmed, do you just stand and watch or do you intervene and try and protect that person? It's an ethical choice. Um, and it's to develop that kind of love. It might not be the same feeling of, it wouldn't be the same feeling of warmth and connection, you know, and intimacy that you would have with a child, but it would be the same feeling that you you cherish all life and you want to protect life at any cost, even if it's the life of your own enemy. Yeah. So even if you see anybody being harmed, you want to try to protect them. So I think that's what we're aiming at. And it's very possible. You know, maybe women do have an extra bonus because they start off as <laughs> some start off as mothers, most perhaps. But uh, I mean, I'm not a mother, but I still feel love and kindness yeah, so for many that, people. Yes. So Treating everybody alike. I mean, just like if you, the way that you treat your own child, treating all well, beings alike protecting them i mean you're not going to be breastfeeding all beings <laughs> just to use <laughs> but you know okay, protecting yeah. life yeah. i think it's yeah. it's talking about yeah. the protective yeah. aspect yeah. yeah yeah but really it's it's uh, something to work with right because none of us know until we've developed it to its greatest and highest degree it's a work in progress so yeah yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Anybody else would like to uh, share or say something or um, complain or <laughs> disagree? You're very welcome. Um, oh, hi. I'd, I'd like to ask hi. you about how you see metta combining with the other Brahma Viharas. Do you see metta as actually underlying, underpinning all the, all the Brahma Viharas? Great question. <laughs> I love that question. I think this is really, um, there are simple answers and there are more complex answers. But for me, I think metta to me seems almost like the basis for the others. Um, in the sense that metta is sort of highlighting the unconditional aspect and it's a kind of um, general feeling of warmth towards all beings, of protection, of friendliness towards all beings, no matter whether they're suffering, whether they're happy, etc. Um, I would see it as a kind of, I mean, I actually don't mind the word love, <laughs> like pure love or unconditional love. Um, for metta, for loving kindness. And I think that same unconditional love, if you like, or that same sense of benevolence um, informs compassion. It, it's, to me, compassion is the way love meets suffering. 
So it's the way meta responds when it comes into contact with maybe people or um, experiences that we would, where the suffering is very um, predominant perhaps. Um, and one of the ways that I once experienced it was simply by practicing metta in an intensive retreat and then by inadvertently choosing another person um, and noticing the nature of that metta change and it changed into something that I could identify as compassion and it wasn't intentional, I carried on the same loving kindness practice but because that person was I guess a person who's been through great hardship in their life, I just felt the quality of it shift to something I could recognize as compassion. And that was really quite instructive to me because I realized that, wow, it's, this, it's almost as though Metta has a natural intelligence as to how it responds. And when it comes into contact with people who are suffering, there's this sense of like, perhaps there's more empathy there or there's a feeling like to want to relieve suffering for that person. So in a similar way, I think that mudita could be seen as the way love responds when it meets people or situations which the, where there's something to rejoice about. You know, maybe people, for example, my teachers, who I can see their freedom sometimes and their peace in their eyes, you know. And I have this sense of loving kindness, but it's not so much emphasizing the protective aspect because they don't need to be protected. They're already free. But there's this sense of joy that arises and it's definitely related to metta but it's more a celebration of another person's happiness and in the same way I do think that equanimity is not separate from all, th all those three I personally feel that equanimity is more of a cooling of the same metta karuna and mudita it's more of a, a sense of care but also understanding our limitations, understanding that there are some situations that we can't really do very much about. You know, there are some um, situations in which we can't do much to help. So it's not aloof, it's not detached, it's not kind of disconnected, it's actually deeply caring, but it also has this sense of perspective. It's like sort of standing on the mountain, maybe there's like a mountain, and on the mountain you meet friends and you perhaps meta, then you meet like sick people or something. <laughs> Karuna comes out and there's some happy people so it's always changing and then you get to the top of the mountain you have all that with you but then you have this perspective across the whole landscape and you realize that you know however much metta however much you try to help however much karuna and duty you develop basically all beings will suffer or you know experience happiness according to their karma according to their own intentions and actions and so there's a sense of wisdom there there's a sense of um, even maybe more deep letting go. So they're just a few um, ways that I would understand it. And I think all four can be a little bit balanced. So like you can balance them according to your own mental state. So I tend to go quite a lot on the compassion side. Like I'm, I'm really attuned to suffering and that can quite easily lead to empathetic distress. You know, I really take it on and feel the suffering. And so for me, it's quite helpful to then practice mudita as well to see that, okay, that's one um, reality in this world, but there are also lots of wonderful things and lots of people doing wonderful things that basically there's a lot of reason to rejoice. So I, I think we can use different uh, Brahma Viharas at different times, but metta seems to be good for pretty much almost everything, almost everything. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes a lot of sense. And <laughs> I I was really pleased to hear you say that because mm. um, they do seem separate um, components. Yeah. Yeah, they're not really, I don't think. Anymore. No, it's interesting, isn't it? Because they can be practiced separately, like as separate practices. In other words, we can change the words, we can change the objects of our awareness from time to time. But, yeah, as I say, in that... Um, practice that I mentioned it was interesting because the compassion then started to change to equanimity after a while and it happened completely naturally I had no concept of practicing compassion or equanimity it just naturally morphed it was like I just got this sort of more expansive cooler sort of um, feeling and it felt a little bit yeah cooler and more profound but it was very natural. Um, I'm not sure I could ever repeat that either. <laughs>
Well, thank you very much. Yeah, you're very welcome. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry uh, that I was trying to oh, uh, okay. unmute my phone and I, I'm just taking Zoom on my phone. Sorry about that. That's and totally just to fine. thank you. Thank you so much for all the explanation. You're very welcome. Thank you for being here and thank you for giving me the chance. It's really nice to um, to do this actually for, for you, but also for Adi and she's going to be um, contributing to my own online group as well, which is really touching and giving a couple of uh, talks for our community online. So it's lovely to feel that you know, the Bikuni Sangha's growing and supporting each other like this. Um, I just want to go to the box because Kumar just wanted me to read out their comment. Um, sorry, I'm not sure if you're a, a he or a she or a they, but um, I think probably a he, maybe. Am I right? <laughs> anyway, they say, thank you. That was a great discussion on loving kindness. Lots of thoughts to ponder with Metta. Great. Yeah, I love talking about this. You know, earlier on today, I was speaking to my friend, as I mentioned, and she was giving me these wonderful uh, examples of her experience with loving kindness. And we both started to feel that loving kindness was starting to grow, you know, as we spoke. Because when you bring up these themes in the mind, it's almost like something inside starts to resonate with that. And it, it starts to, you know, we, it's like perception can be whatever we're aware of tends to grow in our perception, you know? It's like if you attend to the, I don't know, negative qualities in a person, we tend to bring them out in that person, <laughs> you know? Or we tend to bring them out in our own mind and then react to them in that person <laughs> even more. But if we, like, focus on the good side of that person, that also encourages that side to grow in that person and in our mind, right? I mean, is there really any difference? I'm not sure. So for me, this meta is an amazing thing because it's really a training in perception. You know, we can choose to see things different ways and some ways, none of them are exactly accurate until we're free from the hindrances, but some ways are definitely more conducive to developing wholesome states than others. Yeah. Maybe I'll just read out a little sutta to end because there's one that I really like and I used it a bit in my retreat recently. I was in um, Massachusetts on a retreat and it's called, uh, uh, oh, where is, it? where is it, where is it, yeah, it's in here. It's called Bala Pandita Sutta, somewhere in the Majjhima Nikaya. Hopefully I can lay my hands on it. It's in the last few. And it's really nice because it talks about... Um, where is it? Bahadatika. It talks about sila, virtue, and it talks about rejoicing in one's virtue, one's goodness, and uh, and how that can be a source of happiness for us. Let me have a look. Here we are. Good. So, so it says here that this is an example of somebody who's a, a, a virtuous person and it's an example of what we can do to bring up our own virtue in our mind. So it says, when a wise person is on their chair or on their bed or resting on the ground, then the good actions that they did in the past, their good bodily, verbal and mental conduct cover them, overspread them and envelop them. Just as a shadow of a great mountain peak in the evening covers, overspreads and envelops the earth. So too, when a wise person is on their chair or their bed or resting on the ground, then the good actions that they did in the past, their good bodily, verbal and mental conduct, cover them, overspread them and envelop them. Then the wise person thinks, I've not done what is evil, I've not done what is cruel, I've not done what is wicked, I've done what is good, I've done what is wholesome. I've made myself a shelter of anguish, a shelter from anguish. And then there was a little bit more to that. It basically said, I don't know exactly where it is here, but it basically says that um, reflecting in this way, one dwells day and night cultivating wholesome states, delighting in cultivating wholesome states. 
So this is how, you know, we can make Sila a foundation to develop these wholesome states and to feel happy and glad about the way we're living our lives and then to bring that up in our mind and to continue to practice day and night, rejoicing in the development of the wholesome. So whenever you've got a moment, you know, if, even if you're just about to go to bed, just lie down, think a few thoughts of loving kindness, don't waste time. Any, any thought of loving kindness, the Buddha said, is like, it's so valuable. He said it's more valuable than giving so many pots of food to so many wandering aesthetics. <laughs> Just one moment of loving kindness trumps it all. So keep practicing loving kindness. And that's not because you shouldn't feed Aya Adi. That's because if you have loving kindness, you'll feed her even more. <laughs> you'll be coming from pure loving kindness. So your loving kindness will overflow and she'll get really nice and pudgy like me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I better stop being silly now and let you go. And uh, yeah, it was just really nice to be here. And thanks to uh, Venerable Adi for inviting me. And I wish you a very wonderful retreat if you're still listening. And uh, wish you all a lot of happiness in the community that you're developing together. So take care. <laughs>